going to talk a bit about the types of evidence for benefits of vitamin D, uh, discuss briefly the major vitamin D sensitive diseases for Europe, uh, and the effect of vitamin D for these diseases. This would be cardiovascular disease, cancers, respiratory diseases, respiratory infections, diabetes, tuberculosis, Alzheimer's disease, falls, Parkinson's disease, meningitis, and multiple sclerosis. I mean, every time I look at a new disease, I, I find evidence that um, there's a vitamin D uh, link. From this uh, uh, analysis, I'll then uh, estimate the reductions in mortality rates for Europe, give the 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels raised from 54 nanomoles to 105 nanomoles per liter. Now, there are four basic types of epidemiological studies used to quantify and identify and quantify links between risk modifying factors and disease. There's a nested case control study. That's when you generally have, a, say, a cohort. You have a population that's followed for a number of years. Uh, they take a, a, a blood draw at the beginning of the study, and they follow people for 5, 10, 15 years. Unfortunately, the accuracy of linking any disease outcome to the 25 hydroxy vitamin D measurement decreases with time from the blood draw. Uh, there's a case control study in which blood is drawn at time of diagnosis cross-sectional studies in which populations, uh, you survey a large population, and then the ecological study in which populations are defined geographically, both disease outcome and risk modifying factors are averaged by region. Now, the Institute of Medicine was told by their federal sponsors, the National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration, to ignore the case control studies, ignore the ecological studies, to only use nested case control studies and randomized controlled trials. And that was, in my opinion, because the federal agencies did not want to find an effect of vitamin D. <laughs> there are randomized controlled trials. Uh, you all know what these are. These are essential for, for pharmaceutical drugs, which are artificial compounds which man has no experience with. But in my opinion, randomized controlled trials are not essential for understanding the benefits of vitamin D, since 90% of vitamin D comes from the sun uh, and is naturally occurring compound. Uh, these seem to be useful, however, in convincing uh, people who are used to randomized controlled trials that that vitamin D is beneficial and doesn't have harmful <coughs> effects. Unfortunately, too many of the randomized controlled trials use only 400 vitamins per day, uh, which, which, well, that was the amount of vitamin D in a teaspoon or a tablespoon of cod liver oil, which prevented rickets. And in 1997, Michael Hollick and others were on the IOM committee. <coughs> All they could point to was rickets. But times have changed. And unfortunately, they didn't put the vitamin D experts back on the committee this time. They put nutritionists who, who didn't know much about vitamin D. So the effects are seen for 800 to 2,000 IU per day. Uh, another problem is compliance and even vitamin D from other oral intake and, and sunlight interferes with these studies. So in my analyses, I, I base my estimates on a combination of ecological and observational studies <coughs> augmented by an understanding of mechanisms and RCTs when available. Um, Okay. Now, why did it take 54 nanomoles per liter as the mean serum level for Europe and actually for the world? Well, there was a, a study uh, published by uh, Hagenau et al. in Osteoporosis International in 2009 where they looked at studies of serum levels in, in many countries. And they found that essentially 54 nanomoles per liter was the, the, the mean value no matter where they looked. If you think about it, um, if you have dark skin and live in the tropics, uh, especially if you have clothes on and live indoors, you're not going to make much vitamin D. If you live in the uh, mid latitude in Arab countries, they always dress up and, and don't go in the sun, they're going to have low vitamin D. If you live in Europe, uh, it's interesting that in southern Europe, uh, people think they get enough sunlight and make their vitamin D. In northern Europe, they know that they've got to take vitamin D, especially in winter, so you have actually higher serum levels uh, serum vitamin D levels in Northern Europe in winter than in Southern Europe. So anyway, this is the value I've used. Um, now the first one disease, the, the disease that probably causes the most uh, deaths that's linked to vitamin D is cardiovascular disease. Uh, several recent observational studies have found that lower serum levels uh, are associated with higher risk of cardiovascular disease, incidence of mortality rate. The hazard or odds ratios were as high as a factor of two uh, or more for less than 25 versus more than 75 nanomoles per liter. Uh, other evidence is that cardiovascular disease rates are higher in winter, even in warm climates, 
supporting role for UVB and vitamin D. Uh, one of the mechanisms seems to be uh, that uh, higher vitamin D will help put the calcium in the hard tissues, the, the bones and the teeth, whereas lower vitamin D uh, seems to allow uh, calcium to deposit in the soft tissues, such as in the uh, vascular system. I'm not aware of any randomized controlled trials that have yet reported a reduced risk of CBD with respect to vitamin D. Now, I do uh, uh, sort of graphical meta-analyses of the data. Um, what I do is I take uh, published studies, in this case for cardiovascular disease, I will take the median or value of 25 hydroxy vitamin D for the different quantiles of, of the population that they study, plot those, and then I will adjust the hazard ratio for each study by multiplying by a factor to bring all the studies into coincidence. Once I've done that, I can then fit the um, data to a, um, uh, a curve. It can be a power curve, a second order harmonic, a uh, third order, whatever. Um, in this case, it appears that there's a 40% uh, reduction in cardiovascular disease in going from 54 uh, nanomol per liter to um, 105 nanomol per liter. What I've studied for quite a bit is, is vitamin UVB, vitamin D, and cancer. The first epidemiological study hypothesizing a solar UVB to reduction of vitamin D and reduced risk of cancer was published in 1980. The brothers Cedric Garland and Frank Garland, then at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, looked at the map of colon cancer mortality rates in the, uh, in the U.S. and saw a link to solar radiation. And they got there in, the, in September, October of 1974, they saw an earlier version of this map, it only had five gradations in, in the scale. And of all the cancers, only colon cancers uh, stuck out as one in which they saw the lowest rates in the southwest, the highest rates in the northeast. Um, this is a, a, a more recent map with ten color scales. Uh, red, dark red is the highest mortality rate, blue is the lowest mortality rate. And there's a factor of about two difference between the high and the low. Overlay is, is their, uh, the, the, the curve they made from annual uh, solar radiation. And you see that New York has the lowest, about less than 300 uh, units per year, whereas uh, Southwest has more than 500. And so these contours match pretty well. Uh, breast cancer is similar, uh, but there's a problem in California, um, uh, which is, is related to some other risk, risk modifying factor. Uh, when I worked for NASA, I was aware of the ultraviolet B measurements made from the satellite instrument, and I got the map, uh, this is for July 1992, from the total ozone mapping spectrometer. And what you see is the, the it's a very asymmetrical pattern uh, in the United States in the summer, and that's because the western states generally have higher surface elevation than the eastern states, and the westerly prevailing winds try to cross the Rocky Mountains and push the tropopause higher make the stratospheric ozone layer thinner. So there's less UVB blocking from ozone, less atmospheric scatter, and so you have a, a, an asymmetrical pattern. If you go back here, you see it matches pretty well. Uh, it turns out that latitude, per se, is a measure of wintertime uh, vitamin D production, whereas the asymmetry here is very useful for summertime. Now, there have been a number of ecological studies of cancer, not only for the United States, but for, for France, for Spain, for Australia, for China, for Japan. And from these studies, we can conclude that there are about 19 vitamin D, UVB vitamin D sensitive cancers in a positive sense. These include the gastrointestinal cancers, colon, esophageal, gallbladder, gastric, pancreatic, and rectal. Urinary cancers, bladder, <coughs> kidney, male prostate cancer, female breast, cervical, <coughs> endometrial, ovarian, and vulvar, blood Hodgkin's, non Hodgkin's, and the leukemia, and miscellaneous cancers, brain, uh, lung, and even melanoma. Um, the ecological studies are very powerful for several reasons. First of all, cancers generally take 15 to 40 years to progress from initiation to detection or death. And vitamin D uh, has effects at many stages of cancer, including initiation, then angiogenesis, <coughs> uh, anti-angiogenesis, and anti-metastasis. 
It turns out if serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels drop when tumors are ready for angiogenesis, they grow ra rapidly. Uh, in fact, there's an interesting paper that came out last year on breast cancer that breast cancer is most often diagnosed in spring and fall. In summertime, vitamin D can reduce the, the growth of breast cancer. In wintertime, it's melatonin uh, from low sunlight that, that reduces the risk of breast cancer. So, the, the, so it turns out for breast cancer, each time you have a study for longer than three years, you no longer see a statistically significant correlation between vitamin D measured at the beginning of the study and after three years. So it's important to, to um, uh, <coughs> measure vitamin D over long periods of time. Uh, the observational studies provide useful data uh, given those caveats. Now if I take the, the colorectal cancer uh, data and do one of these meta-analyses, there's about, I find about a 30% reduction going from 54 to 105 uh, nanomoles per liter. Uh, I can also point out that in, in agreement with what Michael Hollick showed, that above 75 nanomoles per liter, uh, there's not so much of a change. So 75 is certainly uh, one level one has to think about, but one can even go to 100 nanomoles per liter and still get a benefit for colorectal cancer. For breast cancer, uh, it's similar. Again, there's maybe not much change after about 75 nanomoles per liter. Um, there is the one randomized controlled trial with sufficient vitamin D to show an effect. Um, there are uh, those with higher serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D at time of diagnosis have an increased all cancer survival rate. This has been shown for seven cancers now colon, breast, prostate, non Hodgkin lymphoma, um, one or two more. In fact, the, the um, studies in Norway um, by Johan Moen and, and, and his colleagues, uh, one of whom is here today, have shown that diagnosis of cancer in summer is associated with, uh, with a, about a 20 or 30 percent reduced or increased survival rate compared to diagnosis in winter for breast, I think prostate, ovarian cancer, and maybe one other cancer. As of March 28, there were 2,373 papers with vitamin D and cancer in the title of our abstract is at PubMed.gov. And why the Institute of Medicine couldn't use any of these in their analysis is, has to do with politics and not with science. Respiratory diseases, the most important non-infectious respiratory disease is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, this is primarily caused by smoking. And observational studies have found inverse correlation between lung function and serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. However, a prospective study based on lung function five years after blood draw did not find an association. But I, I, I say that perhaps the long lag means that the, that the effect of vitamin D over the five-year period may not have been a correct determination. Given that this is a somewhat of a weak finding, I'm only uh, assigning a 10% reduction in mortality rates for, for higher levels versus low levels for, for respiratory diseases, not, not, not infectious ones. For respiratory infections, the evidence is much stronger. Uh, the most important ones are influenza and pneumonia. As Michael pointed out, influenza is most common in winter, as Hope Simpson, uh, Edgar Hope Simpson pointed out. Uh, that's because it's cold, the absolute humidity is low, so the virus can live longer outside the body, and vitamin D levels are lower. Uh, bacterial pneumonia can develop after influenza. That's because, first of all, the immune, the, the uh, innate immune system puts out a lot of cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines in fighting influenza, and that can affect the lining of the lungs, which allows bacteria in the lungs to develop to pneumonia. So, uh, vitamin D, which is the macrophages, produces uh, human cathocyanin or LL37. This is a, a polypeptide with modest antimicrobial and potent anti-endotoxin activities. And there's strong evidence that cathocyanin can fight bacterial infection, including dental caries, pneumonia, sepsis, tuberculosis, and possibly meningitis. And it's interesting to go back through the old literature. After I did a study on dental caries, I found a paper from England from 1928, where they were experimenting with vitamin D and children with dental caries. And they thought the effect was to increase the calcium deposition in the, the teeth, make them stronger. But in one paragraph, the, the researcher noted that the bacteria in the mouth that are associated with dental caries were dead. They weren't moving. And that was a key that cathocyanin was, was doing its job. 
Now, for viral infections, uh, vitamin D uh, tries to shift the cytokine production from Th1, Th17 response to Th2, T regulatory profile. And this reduces production of pro-inflammatory cytokines in IL-6, IL-10, IL-17, and TNN uh, alpha. Cathocyte may also play a role. So you already heard about uh, the Edgar Simpson part. Uh, John Connell, who was at the Vitamin D Council, he had a, was a, a doctor at a psychiatric uh, hospital for the criminally insane in California. And he'd been giving his patients 5,000 IU per day, and in 2004, 2005, when a, an, an epidemic of influenza hit his hospital, he was awarded with spirit. So he got to thinking about, well, was it vitamin D that, that reduced the risk? And he ended up writing a paper published in 2006, um, in which he said that it probably was. Uh, as you, uh, like I said, Sabeta has shown that for those with serum levels above 38 nanograms per milliliter, had very little influenza, where those less than 38, uh, half, almost half of the viral, uh, uh, viral respiratory tracts uh, in the uh, three months of the study. Swine flu, they knew about swine flu a couple of years ago. It turns out that all the groups that were vitamin D sensitive, this is uh, pregnant women in the US, Australian Aborigines who stay indoors, uh, those with metabolic diseases, those were these. All these groups had greatly increased risk of, of adverse effects of hospitalization from swine flu. Uh, so showing that was vitamin D sensitive. I tried to contact the, the influence authorities, but it turns out that the, the system has accepted vaccine as a way to deal with this. They didn't want to hear about vitamin D. Type 2 diabetes, you hear about that. Alzheimer's disease. There's not any evidence that low 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. For example, the comorbid diseases for Alzheimer's disease are generally vitamin D sensitive. Cardiovascular diseases, cognitive impairment, diabetes mellitus, depression, dental carriers, osteoporosis, and periodontal disease. Uh, Llewellyn here in the United Kingdom has done several studies on cognitive impairment, cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies showing that uh, lower vitamin D is associated with poor cognition and cognitive impairment is sort of the next step before going to Alzheimer's disease. Tuberculosis, another vitamin D sensitive disease, and especially important here in the United Kingdom among the darker skinned uh, Asians, uh, and I guess Africans that are here. Uh, it used to have the sanatorium where people go and stay in the sun and try to cure their, their tuberculosis. Well, a study in Vietnam found that the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency was 35.4% in the middle of TB and 19.5% in controls. In women, there are no differences. Uh, it turns out that, uh, unfortunately, treating those with tuberculosis and vitamin D doesn't always work. And I think part of the problem is that, that when you start treating a, a disease that's in contact with the blood with vitamin D, you start producing a lot of 125-hydroxy vitamin D, which can lead to hypercalcemia. Uh, so you have to be a little careful with that. <coughs> Falls and fractures, uh, the classical function of the <coughs> to regulate calcium absorption metabolism. But falls and fractures are also linked to musculoskeletal effects. Yeah, you have better neuromuscular control with higher vitamin D levels. <coughs> and uh, randomized control trials indicate about a 20% reduction in falls and fractures for those taking 800 versus 400 IU per day. For Parkinson's disease, there's again mounting evidence, but not convincing evidence yet. However, a study in Denmark found that, that there was a, a dose response relationship between outdoor work and reduced risk of Parkinson's disease. In the United States, those living in higher latitudes uh, have lower Parkinson's disease rates. Uh, meningitis is not often thought of as a vitamin D sensitive <coughs> disease, but um, uh, it has the characteristics of a vitamin D sensitive disease. Uh, there's peak rates in winter, often overlapping with influenza epidemics, sometimes with respiratory sensitial virus, which has a modest vitamin D uh, effect. Mortality rates for African Americans were 1.45 and 3.32 times higher than mortality rates for whites and Asian Pacific Islanders. And uh, mortality rates for rose and in the final summer. So I, I, it's, it's interesting to go to PubMed and try to search uh, things like season and ethnic backgrounds, geographical variations. There are all sorts of ways to try to scientifically link uh, disease to low UVD and vitamin D. Um, and then once you get the link, you do more observational studies and then eventually randomized controlled trials. So the whole process can take five or 10 years to go from 
observation like this to, to an ironclad, yes, that it is a vitamin sensitive disease, and yes, we can treat it or prevent it with vitamin D. Local sclerosis, that's very clearly a vitamin D sensitive disease. Epstein Barr virus is an important risk factor. Um, local sclerosis is higher in spring. Uh, there's a latitude effect I've been observed in three comments. I've done a uh, just a ecological study of data from a uh, uh, paper by Wallen and uh, uh, Kurtzke et al. that they used uh, veterans from World War II and the Korean conflict in the United States. And it's a sort of second order fit to the uh, data by latitude. The summertime has several, uh, several states um, at this latitude jump up to here. So that shows it's not a summertime effect, it's really a wintertime effect. So, the economic and, 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 and society burden of, of uh, low vitamin D. What I've done here is I've, I've um, looked at the uh, mortality rate data available from the World Health Organization for 2004 for all of Europe. And so it's easy to go through and just pick out the, the diseases. So for cardiovascular diseases, that has the highest mortality rate. And then I can put in an estimated value, say it's 25%, maybe it's 20%, but I, I have 25% here. And just go across and, and estimate the number of deaths that can be considered premature due to low vitamin D. And we'll go through each of the diseases and do the same analysis. And at the end, one finds a total of 7,744,000 uh, 900, uh, deaths per year of which 1,977,000 1, or 1,000 can be considered uh, premature or reduced. Now, if you look at all diseases, all causes, it's about a 21% reduction in all-cause mortality rate. Um, if I do again, I want a graphical meta-analysis. Uh, it turns out this is based on observational studies of people aged 45 years or older at the time of enrollment. And it comes out with a 26% reduction in going over the same uh, rate. But um, in this analysis, this is for all ages. And you have a lot of people who die at younger ages from accidents and, and uh, malnutrition and, and, and whatever that wouldn't be included in this study. So this is a, a reasonably good uh, uh, correlation. So the implications of this study are that um, life expectancy would increase by two years. In fact, I have a, a paper coming out in the July issue of the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition, in which I've done the same analysis for the six major geopolitical regions of the world, including Africa, Southeast Asia, and so on. In Africa, they have only about a 45-year uh, life expectancy, but at 45 years of age, they have a longer remaining life expectancy than, say, Europe with an average uh, a mean population age of uh, life expectancy 75 years. So in all countries, there's a two-year life extension by having the higher levels of vitamin D. Um, healthy, life health, healthy life expectancy probably increased by about the same amount, if not more. The direct cost for health care may drop by about 10%. Uh, a lot of health care, well, in the United States certainly, a lot of the health care expenses are in the last year or two of life dealing with cardiovascular disease, uh, cancers, and, and very expensive interventions to add maybe a year of life. Um, it could be uh, it could be as high as 20% reduction in, in uh, health costs. On top of the direct costs, you also have all the indirect costs. Time lost from work, uh, unpaid caregiving by family and friends, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et so, so the, it, it turns out you can get in the United States, you get a year's supply of vitamin D for about $10, for about seven pounds. Um, and so that makes vitamin D supplementation or exposure to the sun or in the most cost-effective way to increase, uh, reduce the burden of disease and increase uh, health. I have a project for John Cannell to uh, provide documents on the approximately 100 uh, diseases looking at the effects from the literature of UV exposure and vitamin D. Um, it's been a daunting task. I'm, I've completed about 70 documents. I've got another 10 or 20 to do before May 15th when this will go online and be publicly available at vitamindcouncil.org. 
and there will be both a patient-friendly 600-word version uh, that, uh, that a 12-year-old can understand, and then there will be under that the, the, the technical document, which has the abstract, some abstracts from PubMed and some of the some discussion of, of the findings there. So this will be a, a valuable resource starting in May. We update it quite, quite frequently. I'll be working on this pretty much the next year. Here is just a, uh, there's a list, uh, go through if you don't have time, this is an chart right now, but uh, it'll be, be able to get us to remove this. Um, the Institute of Medicine, we already talked about that. Uh, there have been at least 28 letters, editorials, and papers in the journal literature so far attacking the credibility of this report. Uh, they, they, they're just, it's just unscientific. It's just <laughs> I don't have to say more about it. Additional resources, um, uh, quite a few resources, and uh, nothing else on at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Though. Any questions for Bill on any of, uh, any of that presentation? Um, what are the back? Uh, during the, the, the swine flu epidemic, they found that the, the colored people um, were overrepresented amongst the uh, those who had severe disease. Uh, just before he retired, Professor Liam Donaldson was being interviewed uh, sometime in December, I think around the same time we had the uh, last meeting. And he commented that, um, I think in the London area, <coughs> that um, uh, amongst the, 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 the children, uh, in this area who had uh, joint flu, the colored population, especially the Asians, were also uh, greater, there was greater mortality. It was interesting that maybe there is a, um, a, an association because in that population, uh, there is um, a high rate of uh, vitamin D uh, deficiency. Right. right. Well, the United States, uh, African Americans have a, a mean uh, vitamin D level of 15 nanograms, I think about 37 nanomoles. White Americans have uh, 25 or 67 nanomoles. So it's a 40% reduction of vitamin levels for African Americans. And they have about 25% higher rates of many diseases, including cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, and so on. And I think that a lot of their, their disease problems are linked to low vitamin D. Um, I just have to voice at least, at least the contrary opinion, and it applies to Mike's talk as well, because most of what you've presented are associations, and it's consistently said association is not causation. For example, um, the, latitudinal, the latitudinal relationships with disease, you know, implying that less UV re results in less ultraviolet light, um, sorry, less UV, less UV, Less UV, less vitamin D, um, more disease. That relationship is contradicted, and Paul Lipsky's saying this, by the fact that 25 hydroxy D levels tend to rise with latitude across most of the world. Um, and furthermore, the associations that relate to higher 25 hydroxy D levels are things that are attributable to lifestyle. You know, a healthy outdoorsy lifestyle is someone who's going to end up living longer and have less of the disease that you are associating. So, in other words, coincidence does not mean that vitamin D is the total solution to it. I just have to add that for Viso. So I'm opening, you know, the question to you is how, what's your rebuttal to the concept, for example, that higher 25D in the north seems to contradict your suggestion of the ecology effect? Well, um in my ecological studies, I found that the best studies are done in, in single countries. I admit that there's a problem in Europe because once you get about 35 or 40 degrees latitude, uh, you have more dietary changes that are important and more genetic changes. For example, cardiovascular disease increases latitude in Europe, and I've linked that to the uh, APOD exon 4 the same gene as the risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, also increases latitude and is a risk factor for heart disease. Uh, but there, uh, a. Bradford Hill, in 1965, gave an address to the British Medical Society about uh, cause, uh, causality in a biological system. He laid out uh, about nine different 
factors that you have to look at. One is strength of association. One is consistency. Do you find the same effect in different populations? Uh, one is do you have mechanisms? One have you done an experiment? Uh, can you rule out confounding factors? Uh, does the, uh, the effect precede, does the cause precede, the agent precede the effect? And I've done analyses like this for cancer. And for several types of cancer, breast and colorectal cancer and some of the other cancers, if the, if the, the effect is very strongly or strongly supported, uh, supports the, the, the pill criteria. Um, for multiple sclerosis, we have all those criteria in place. Uh, for cardiovascular disease, it's a little weaker. Um, you know, some of these are at the beginning stages, but uh, it's not just latitude that we look at it. It's quite a few things in addition to 